singing this morning. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark 1. And uh, we are in a study working our way through the book of Mark, examining the life of Christ and looking at him and observing and hearing uh, his life so that we can, as Romans 8, 29 says, be conformed to his image, that we can be more like him. And what I want us to understand is as we observe Christ, as we witness him and listen to him, we need to understand that we are also seeing God the Father. Uh, because Christ himself even said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father in John 14. He is declaring him to us. He even said that in, as we read in John 1, that uh, it says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And the word declared means to reveal, to unveil, to make something known. And so if we want to understand God better, look at Christ. Examine him and look at him. And so sometimes I think, however, we get in our minds this idea that, that God is this whip-cracking, hating sin you know, so ominous type of a being that there's no way that he actually cares about people because people are sinners. And there's no way that he could actually love us. And, and we get this idea in our minds that he's so holy, which he is, and he is separate from sin that he can't possibly love us. Now, Although some of those attributes are accurate, the idea that he doesn't love us is completely inaccurate. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, the ultimate display that God isn't just some aloof, uh, you know, hating type of a God is displayed in the cross, is displayed in the communion table that we recognize that, that He loved us that much. And so he's, he's not a hateful God, He's a compassionate God. Uh, we read that as we understand Christ. We see His compassion. We see He's a God who cares for the hurting, the depressed, the down and out. Remember as Jesus, we've read this or talked about this several times in this study. As, as Jesus began His ministry and He came into Nazareth early on in His ministry. And He, he, he took out the scroll, the scroll of Isaiah and began to read. And think about the words of what He said as He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord that's a that's a message of compassion he, he came as you think about those words the poor the brokenhearted the captives the blind the oppressed. This isn't some uncompassionate, unloving Jesus Christ, and He is declaring the Father to us. So we get an idea that God is for us. He cares for the hurting. He cares for those who are going through struggles. And so the question is, 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 that, is that needed today? Is there needs is there needs in our community that are real? Is there the, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the oppressed? Is that real needs in our community today? Yeah. Is it real needs within our church in this building today? Yeah. Let me just give you some statistics nationwide that shows this is, this is needed. There are needs around us constantly. 554,000 people annually have no safe, regular place to sleep. They are homeless on any given night in America. On any given night, there is over half a million people that have nowhere to sleep. There are over 400,000 children in foster care in the United States. 74, just in Center County, who are in need of safe homes. According to the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, 21.5 million American adults ages 12 and older battle a substance use addiction. There are 16.1 million U.S. adults struggling 
with depression in any given year. 6.9% of all adults in the country. That's, one out, that's less than one out of every 15 people that are at some point struggling with depression. According to the Justice Department, <clears throat> on average there are 321,500 victims ages 12 or older of rape or sexual assault each year in the United States. One out of every six American women has been the victim of an attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. And that's only the ones that are reported as victims. Roughly 15 million people are living with and battling cancer in various forms every year in the United States. More than 10 million vic- there are more than 10 million victims of domestic violence and abuse every year in homes in the United States. And we could go on and on with other statistics of, of those who are widows, those who are single mothers, those with special needs children, those who have mental or physical handicaps. And we could go on and on with other statistics, but we recognize through this, man, there is needs. There is needs all around us. And we don't need uh, what, what the Bible presents is we, and we recognize is we don't need a Christianity that is only for those who fit a perfect box. If everything in your life is perfect and you're never going to have problems, then Christianity is for you. No, the Christianity, the message of good news is to those who are hurting, those who are oppressed, those who are struggling, that good news comes because Jesus Christ cares. And we have a God who is loving and He cares. We have a God who is compassionate and enters into our plight and our struggles and our shame and will compassionately take us by the hand and lovingly provide freedom and hope. And so this morning, we're going to see just that in Jesus. And that's the joy of Christianity. That there is hope. There is joy as we know that Jesus cares. And so we, we just noted in the previous last and two weeks ago, <clears throat> Christ's power uh, over the uh, as we looked at the previous text, and we were looking at kind of a, a day in the life of Jesus, but he has incredible power. What we're going to look at today is Christ's compassion as he cares about needs. And, and maybe you're here this morning because you're needing to hear that because, man, you're struggling with some certain circumstances that you're facing. And you're needing to recognize that God cares for you. You may feel alone. You may feel helpless or hopeless, and you need to hear that, that God does care for you. Or maybe you're here because you need to have your eyes opened and to see what Christ-like living looks like to those who are living right around us, to, to, that we would develop a greater compassion, a greater Christ-likeness, a greater godliness, and to see needs around us, and, and not just say, well, we should pray for those folks, which we should, but to say, how can I get involved? How can I come and help meet those needs? And so as we look at Christ this morning, really the question is, is how are we going to be more drawn to Him? How can we become more like Him? How can, we, how can we enjoy walking and following in the footsteps of our Master? Let's pray together, and then we'll walk through this text this morning. Father, we thank You for the opportunity to study and understand what a loving and caring and compassionate God that You are. It's demonstrated, us, demonstrated for us in the cross and the resurrection. As we, as we come to the communion table, we're reminded once again of your love for us. But Lord, as we see that, that that gospel love penetrates not only into our sinfulness, but all of the consequences that we see and the effects of sin that are in our world today. And you step into that. And so God, I pray this morning that we would be challenged and motivated and drawn to you greater because of this. And we love you, Lord. It's your name we pray. Amen. Now, again, you may remember that we were looking at last time a day in the life of Jesus, looking at a 24-hour period from, from sunup on the Sabbath on that Saturday until sunup the next morning. Now, we didn't get through all that in, in one service, as I was hoping. And so we kind of got through the daylight hours from sunup to sundown. And then had to break from there. But we're picking up with Jesus in Capernaum. He had just been in the synagogue in the morning. Had, had preached. 
had, had cast out a demon on someone there that had gone to the house of Peter right there in Capernaum and had healed Peter's mother-in-law and was there for the afternoon on this Sabbath day. We've now come to the close of the day and we're going to pick up in the text and, and see Christ's compassion continue as we're going to notice, first of all, in verses 32 to 34, Christ's repetitious compassion. So we read in verse 32, at evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick and various, with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. <clears throat> Now, again, this is the Sabbath, and so they would have been, the people in the community would have been prohibited from carrying those who have diseases and ailments and, and, and taking them to the, to the house during the day of the Sabbath because that would have been considered work according to the rabbinical laws. And so they would have had to wait until the sun had set, and so Mark makes it evident that the sun had set, and now the crowds rush in. Now think about the scenario for a moment when word has just gone out that Jesus Christ has come in and he's cast out a demon from someone. He has preached powerfully and, and has spoken to their needs and he's also just healed someone. And all of a sudden everybody's saying, well maybe he can do it for our situation. Maybe this, this healer guy has come in and we should go see him. And they should say, they're all thinking, well, we should take our friend so-and-so or our relative so-and-so or we can get there to his house and we can take him. But they're having to wait until the Sabbath sun sets. So kind of like kids on Christmas morning, you know, waiting. Mom and dad had said, you can't get out of bed until the clock says 7 0 And so they're watching, they're in their beds and they're watching. And as soon as the clock hits 7, man, they're busting out of there going towards the Christmas tree. Well, here they are. And according to Sabbath law, Sabbath didn't end until the sun had set and three stars were visible in the sky. So I imagine like people in their homes like watching sun go down, sun go down. Okay, I see one star. I see the next one. And man, the third star is, is seen and, and everybody just starts rushing to the house of Peter where Jesus is at. It says that the whole town is gathered at the door with their needs. And it says that they brought them to him. And the, the tent there is an idea of a continual bringing. It was just a continual line of people. One after another after another coming to see Jesus. And what we see is that he doesn't say, hey, I am tired I'm done. I've healed some people. I've done some ministry. I did some nice things for people. Now the rest of you go home. I'm done. He doesn't say that. He takes time with every single person. What's your, what's your ailment? What's going on? Hey, come over. And he touches each one and cares for them. And he heals many. In fact, it says many here, but Matthew's gospel actually says he healed all who came to him. Every single one. You know what that tells me? Is it doesn't matter what your ailment is. It doesn't matter what your needs are. Jesus is willing to meet every need. He takes his time with every single person. That repetitious, continual care of compassion. And then... We find that he doesn't allow the demons to speak there. And, and we may be wondering, well, well, why is that? Why does he not allow the demons to speak? And why later on, after he heals the leper, as we read in verses 44 and 45, why does, why does he tell the leper, don't tell anybody? Don't say anything. and Just go show yourself to the priest. Well, the reality is, is we're not told. <clears throat> so we can, we can make some uh, surmises on it and I think there are some plausible options we aren't told I think it's very plausible that he was recognizing that the demons would want to distract from him giving out gospel transformational life-saving truth 
And if they could make this thing explode into sensational, just miracle-working man-type things, then it would distract from the gospel being presented. And he's not wanting that. He's, he's wanting to help meet physical needs, but his greatest desire is he wants to meet spiritual transformation in hearts. He wants to show that, hey, I not only care about your physical situation, but I care about your, I care about your spirit. I care about your being and who you are. And the greatest hope I can give you, the greatest peace I can give you is not a physical healing, but a spiritual healing. And I think in, in my estimation and things that I've studied as well, I think that he was constantly saying, don't go just spread around a physical healing. Because that's not really the total emphasis of why I came. I came to preach the gospel of good news. I came to transform lives. And of course, Satan was going to try to do everything he could to distract from that. And so he tells them, don't say anything. He makes them be quiet. But we get the image here as he then is going to go out to other cities. We get the image of a compassionate Savior taking care of many many people late in the night. But then it moves from Christ's repetitious compassion to the next part of Christ's resource of compassion. So we've come now through about 16 hours of this day. It's now late at night. We aren't told what time, but it has been a long, long day for him. We've seen his wisdom in preaching, his power in sharing the scriptures. We've seen his power in casting out demons, his heart of compassion and healing people. And and one thing that we don't sense is a sense of impatience or urgency or panic. He stays calm and focused. We we don't sense at the end of the day, he says, man, I'm done. And I don't want to, I don't want to get off this, take my head off the pillow for, for like two days. I am so wiped out. Now we would think after a day like that, if anybody deserves to be able to hit the snooze button, for a couple times, it's Jesus. I mean, he's just gone through all of that. Preaching and teaching and healing and casting out demons. Spiritual warfare. Physical things that was drawn out of him. We would think that he would stay and just rest for a while. But yet, where he found the greatest source of ability for power. And the greatest ability to extend continual compassion was in prayer. It says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight he went out and departed to a solitary place and there he prayed later simon and those who were with him searched for him and when they found him they said to him everyone is looking for you but he said to them let us go into the next towns that i may preach there also because for this purpose i have come forth and he was preaching their synagogues throughout all galilee and casting out demons And so what we're recognizing is that this resource for power and compassion came through prayer. This was his regular pattern. In fact, during his ministry, according to my count, I counted 25 times that Jesus would get away privately to pray. He would would walk away from the crowds, walk away from his disciples because he recognized if he was going to continue putting out like that, continually having heart of compassion, continually having power in the ministry, it wasn't by his own human strength. And I think what it displays for us is even though Christ is divine, he also had a human nature that needed fueled up regularly and daily by the power of God the Father. And and I think it teaches us something. If Christ in his humanity, although in being both divine and human in his both natures, if he needed regular uh, power from God the Father and compassion from God the Father to do his ministry, how much more do we? We need to have that being tapped in. We are so oftentimes, though, pressed with the urgency of the tyranny of the now. We're a busy people. And, and the busier we become, the more we sense, well, I don't have time for that today. I've got to go out and I've got to tackle the day. I've got all these things on my checklist of to do today. And, and so I really don't have time to take an hour in the morning today for prayer and, and, and to spend time with this. I've got to go out and hit it. And listen, we all struggle with that at times. I'm not going to raise, ask for a raise of hands because mine would be up with yours as well because I'm an A-type go-getter just like you are. 
my day off, I've got a checklist of things to do. And every day I come into the office, I've got a pile of things that I want to tackle for the day. And it is a, it is a constant reminder to me to stop. And to say, I can't do this on my own. And Christ recognized the same thing. That's why he even said in, in John 5, we, re, we read as he tells them, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Then he says later on in John 14, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Jesus was saying, this is as the Father has open action in my life, it's pouring out into lives around me. Because he was human like we are. He had a flesh. He had busy schedules around him. And it was a challenge to say, I'm going to stop and I'm going to tap into the Father. I'm going to spend time and just quietness. And here he wakes up early before the light of day and goes out into a solitary place. D.L. Moody once said, we ought to see the face of God every morning before we see the face of man. I think if he were speaking in today's society, he would put it this way. We ought to see the face of God before we check our Facebook feed. Before we get onto our electronics, and we all have them, and it's so tempting to get up in the morning and say, let me see what everybody else has posted for today. But to stop and say, before I check all of that, before I cloud my mind with all the stuff going on everywhere else, I need to clear my mind and just talk with the Father. And let Him speak to me. Let Him direct my thoughts and my actions. Psalm 5, 3, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. Psalm 88, 13, to you I have cried, O Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. And so we find Jesus is getting aside here. And we might think, well, well wait, Jesus, there's, there's so much more that you could be doing in this time. I mean, the crowds are coming and, you know, we could set up campaigns and, and great crusades and, and, and we, could, we could rent out the largest auditoriums here in Capernaum in the Galilee region and, and we, could, we could arrange for the hottest band to open up and, and we could set up a, a new nonprofit, the Capernaum Project, and, and we could really make this thing go big. And Jesus says, push that out. Push out the urgency of the, the tyranny of the urgency because the pr greatest priority is prayer. The greatest priority is prayer. You know what? If God wills those things to happen, He'll bring those things to happen. But so many times I think we rush into them and maybe it wasn't God's plan to start with. And we aren't going out the day powered up and fueled up with power through prayer. And so that's the secret. The, all, all the power to the Christian life comes not from us doing our, our dead level best to serve God, but it comes from Him, granted to us moment by moment in the demand is, as the demand is upon us. And so what tips do we learn about personal prayer time with God from Jesus? Well, just a couple of things that I note here. First of all, it was planned. It, it wasn't accidental. He planned, I am going to get up and spend time with God the Father. It was planned. It was private. He got alone into a solitary place. Just him and God. And I would encourage that same thing. To have a planned, regular, daily, alone time with God. I would encourage early in the morning. Why start out a day not fueled up and spent time with the one who can direct your day and make it the way it ought to be? Start in the morning. That's something I had to learn. I used to, growing up, I used to always read my Bible at night and um, before I'd go to bed, and, which I think has merit to it as well to kind of think over things as you kind of rest your mind to go to sleep. But I began to realize as I was starting days, and I was starting days and just kind of jumping at them on my own strength that I needed to stop. And I learned throughout college, morning has got to be my time and, and took that forward. But it was planned. It was private. It was prolonged. He was there for a while, a long while before daylight. I don't think Simon Peter comes along till later on. I mean, the crowds are coming around. I would imagine sun's up. And Jesus has been out there praying for some time. And it was powerful. 
This is where he's fueled up, ready to continue doing ministry. He says, now let's go out and do more ministry. Let's go out to the next towns. Let's go, let's go take the gospel to the next places. And he, he wants to preach and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news everywhere. Josephus, a first century historian, records that there was over 200 different cities and villages of substantial size around the Galilee region. And Jesus says, I want to go meet needs there and there and there and there. We've got a lot of work to do, guys. But he started with prayer. He started there. And that's the resource of compassion. So we've seen his repetitious compassion. We've seen his resource of compassion. And then thirdly, we see his readiness his willingness, you might say, of compassion. <clears throat> in these verses, we see the extent of compassion Christ was ready and willing to extend. And, and I want us to notice, as it starts with, now a leper came to him. And I want you to notice the condition of leprosy. It tells us a leper came to him. Leprosy was one of the most feared diseases of the ancient world. Because it could be transmitted so easily by, by touch or even by the air, it could be transmitted and there was no cure for it. And so it was a deadly, if you got it, it was very, very rare that you would ever be making it through. It was a deadly disease. Now, and I want you to put yourself in the life of this man for a minute. Let's think what it was like for this man coming to Jesus. So he starts... Leprosy is a, is a skin and nerve disease, and it usually starts, it, it starts to manifest itself in some skin pore issues and, and dryness, and then it starts to either get a flakiness or you start to see these, these uh, uh, boil type things appear. And so I imagine this guy is going along in his day, possibly married, possibly has kids, and all of a sudden he starts to see some of this stuff happen on his skin. He tries to wash it off maybe for a day or two, and then he shows his wife, these things aren't going away. I need to go. I need to go. According to Leviticus 13, the protocol is I have to go down to the priest at the temple and, and have them check me out. But, but don't worry, honey. It'll be okay. I'm sure it's nothing. And, but I've got to do this because I don't, I don't want you guys to get infected. So I'm going to travel 80 to 90 miles down to Jerusalem, and I'm going to have this checked out. And he gathers his kids and his family the, the morning of, and he says, I'm going to go down to Jerusalem. I'll be gone for a little while. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. I'll be back in a little while. Travels down to Jerusalem. Schedules an appointment to meet with the priest. And the priest would analyze uh, these, these pores and analyze the skin and, and would look at it. And, and the, the priest would look him over and then he would pull back away and says, you have leprosy. You are unclean. No longer are you permitted in the temple you cannot come bring sacrifices. You cannot come and worship. You cannot go to the synagogue. You cannot be in any walled cities because they also put this with a curse of God. If you got leprosy, they, they link this to God has his hand of cursing upon you. You are unclean. Leave this city. Leave here right now. So the man walks out of the priest's office or wherever he was at. And according again to Leviticus 13 protocol, you had to, after you were declared unclean, you had to rip your garments to show that, it was, that you were unclean. You had to put a garment over your face, and everywhere you had to go, you had to, you had to call out, unclean, unclean, so everybody would know to keep a distance from you. So the man walks out. He's in Jerusalem, busy streets, busy area. He walks out, and he realizes, oh, I've got to do this. There's people. He rips his garment, puts the thing over his face, and for the first time in his life, he calls out, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. And a mother with her children pulls away. Kids, kids, don't go near that man. He, he's, he's a disgrace. He's, he, he's, he's got this skin disease. Don't go near him. Shopkeepers, as he walks through Jerusalem, say, hey, don't come near my shop. Don't touch anything. Stay away. And he goes throughout the whole city of Jerusalem crying out unclean. And everybody's saying, we don't want to see this man. Stay away from me. He's never felt this kind of shame before. Walks out of Jerusalem, starts making the journey back home. But the worst is yet to come. Comes back to Capernaum or whatever city that he was from. And his family and friends start to see him come. And they start to run towards him. He says, stop, stop. 
Don't come near me. I'm unclean. Don't call me your father anymore. Don't call me your husband. I can't be that for you anymore. I'm dead. Don't come near me. And he has to push away all of those who were his loved ones and they can't be near him. He has to stay outside the city. They would actually hold a, oftentimes, a funeral for that man. The rabbis called them the walking dead. And everywhere he'd go, he'd have to cry out unclean. He'd have to camp out on his own in a solitary place. And then the disease starts to take over. The nerve and skin disease starts to be where you have no more feeling. You often hurt yourself. You might do work and not realize that a nail is on your handle all day long and, and whatever. And they would often grab things out of a fire and not realize the heat of it because they would feel nothing. Boils and their skin starts to become deformed. Their faces become deformed. They start losing limbs. And the Bible says that actually in Luke, it says that this man was full of leprosy. He had most likely lost limbs. He was gnarled up. His face was hur furled up and had sores and, and oozing. And then it also affected your larynx. And so even talking became hoarse and raspy. So this man comes to Jesus. He's gnarled up. He's been cast off for a lengthy amount of time with people. And he, everybody pushed him away. And, and he comes to Jesus and, and he says to him, imploring him, kneeling down and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. He's, he's not questioning Christ's ability. He's actually questioning Christ's compassion. If. Lord, I've seen what you've done. I've seen the evidence of people have been healed. I know you can do this. But But me? A gnarled up, foul smelling, grotesque leper? Are you willing to come to my need? And not only do we see the condition, then we see the compassion of the Lord as he says and makes this, this plea. It says, Then Jesus moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion, and the tense there, the idea, is that compassion took over. It, it touched the very recesses of his entire being as it started to overwhelm him. It's in a passive tense that Jesus was just overwhelmed by compassion. He's moved by it. Let me ask you this question. When you see someone in misery, someone who's going through a difficult time, does that same compulsion of being moved with compassion come upon you if we want to be like christ we need to pray god help me to feel like that help me to see needs and feel their needs so i can come alongside so he's moved with compassion he feels the leper's pain and loneliness and and hopelessness and, and notice it says there it says he was moved with compassion and he stretched out his hand and touched him you don't touch lepers. That's, that's against all the protocol. And the, the, ver, the word there actually means that he latched onto. He gripped onto. He, he grabs the man, maybe by the shoulders, with compassion. This man probably hasn't been touched compassionately for years. No one's ever touched him like that. No one's ever loved him like that. I, I was reading from R. Kent Hughes' works, his studies and he was talking about one time when he was a pastor and he was counseling a man who was not a believer didn't have family around didn't have a church family and the man was so lonely that he would go and have his hair get cut every week so that somebody would touch him you know there's people around us like that that they don't feel that people care they don't feel compassion and what people need is not a Christian that says, well, you should have done this, and you got to put this, and you got to box. Just come and touch me. Come put your arm around me and say, what can I do? How can I help? Can I just listen? To care. That's Christianity. 
to come to people's needs and to care. And so he touches him. And then he says to him, I am willing to be cleansed. Yes, I'm willing. Not only am I able, but I'm willing. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. What we see here is is really just the heartbeat of compassion that Jesus has. Compassion, as J.C. Watts Jr. put it, can't be measured in dollars and cents. It does come with a price tag, but that price tag isn't the amount of money spent. The price tag is love. And Christ is modeling for us the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That's the kind of God that we serve. He's a caring God, a loving God. 1 John 4, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. So seeing all this this morning, there's two possible questions that we need to face. Have you received the love of God in Christ Jesus? Maybe you're here today and, and, and the words that exemplify this, this leper of unwanted, unloved, unclean, and you feel the same, same disdain or things are going on in your life and you're saying, I need, I need someone who will care for me. And I want to tell you, Jesus cares for you. So maybe you're here today, and you need to, you need to recognize that, that whether, it's, whether it's depression and anxiety you're going through, whether it's an addiction that you've been facing, whether it's, uh, whether it's you're going through a financial struggle, whatever it is that you're going through, Jesus cares. And you just needed to hear that today. That you might draw closer to Him and say, I just want Him. Oh, my friends, all who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. He's eager to put his arms around you. Maybe you're here today and you needed to hear this because you need to be reminded that that's what Christianity is. Christianity isn't me trying to fix everybody's problems by telling them you're going to do this, X, Y, and Z, and it's, this wouldn't have ever happened if you'd done A, B, and C, but now you got to do X, Y, and Z, and you got to fit into this box. The Christianity is loving compassion. Coming to the hurting, putting your arm around them and saying, I have compassion for you like Christ has, and I care. I'm here. I'm here. Heard a story one time about a it was a new pastor to a church in an inner city area. And he was one day in his study looking out the window across the landscape of the city and was just weeping over it. And one of the other men who had been in the church for a long time and tried to come along and console him and said, Pastor, I realize this is hard to look at at first, but you'll get, you'll get used to it. And the pastor said, that's what breaks my heart is that I'll get used to it. I don't want to get used to it. I want to still be moved by compassion. I think sometimes it's easier for us to just get used to it. There's needs all around us. And I, and I recognize that maybe you can't meet every single need. That's impossible. But maybe God has a heart of compassion in a certain area. The homeless. The foster kids. Cancer survivors or strugglers. Those who are going through financial struggles. Those who are going through depression and anxiety. Maybe there's an area that you say, that's really God has given me a heartbeat for. Pursue that. Go after that. So that we might be the loving hands of God. Extending that grace and help to others that are needing it. And so, as we come to the communion table this morning, we're reminded that's the model of God's love. That's how much He loved us. 
do we come to the table and just partake of it and say, boy, isn't it great that I've got this? Or we think, that's what I need to share with others. I need to share that good news with others. I need to share the love of Christ with others and not just be a, a you know, a, a selfie-centered Christian. I need to be a, an other-centered, a landscape, a portrait centered Christian of other people and caring for those needs. Let's, let's pause for a moment. We're going to pray together. And then I'm going to ask, after I pray, I'm going to ask for Kurt to come. He's going to sing a song just to kind of prepare our hearts for the communion table. As we're going to come to this table, and, and the Bible says that this is a time for believers, and we extend communion to all who know Christ as their Savior. As a Come to the table to be reminded of God's love and His grace which He's bestowed upon us. And just to search our hearts, to be reminded of that and search where we are with Christ. Maybe it's to come and receive a fresh, a warmth of His love. Maybe it's to search, how can I share that love with others? So let's pray together, and then Pastor Kurt will come, and the deacons will come prepare for the communion together. Father, we thank You for the reminder this morning from Your Word of Your love and Your grace. God, we recognize that there are needs all around us. God, we go through times in our lives where we may hit different situations and we feel, we feel burdened and overwhelmed. Lord, whatever, there might, whatever needs there might be today, I pray that these words of, of Christ here in the Gospel of Mark would speak to our lives that there is a place to go. There is a loving God who with arms wide open welcomes all who come to Him. And God, I pray that as well as believers, as we want to become more like You, as we see Christ model that, that we would be followers of Him, that we would seek after a heart of compassion for others. God, would You open our eyes, help us to not just walk out of these doors this morning and, and say, well, that was a nice service, and go along our way and be untouched by the needs around us. Lord, move us with compassion. And so thank you for your words this morning. As we come now to the table, reminding us of the ultimate display of compassion, the giving of Jesus Christ on the cross. May it touch our hearts again this morning. And we'll thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.